and I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's presentation. Before we get underway, I'd like to mention a couple of housekeeping items. All attendees are in listen-only mode, but questions may be asked by typing them into the question box on the webinar toolbar at any time. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Participation in today's webinar is with one CES credit, and your transcript will be updated within a couple of weeks. Additionally, a link to download a PDF copy of the presentation was included in the webinar credentials sent out earlier this morning. I'm excited to welcome Jennifer M. Gartland, Deputy Director of the Federal Maritime Commission's Office of Consumer Affairs and Dispute Resolution Services as our speaker today. Her office provides ombuds, mediation, facilitation, and arbitration services to the shipping public. Ms. Gartland also practiced law at Thompson Hine LLP, where she represented clients in contract negotiations, regulatory licensing and enforcement actions, and alternative dispute resolution proceedings before federal regulatory agencies. She began her career as an honors attorney with the U.S. Department of Transportation and has published articles and regularly gives presentations on the use of ADR to resolve regulatory and commercial shipping disputes. She holds an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center and a JD from the Catholic University of America. We are thrilled to have her present for us today, so without further delay, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Cecilia for the opportunity to speak with you about the exciting programs and initiatives that we have at the Commission. And just as a quick ethics disclaimer, the remarks I will be making today are my own and are not attributable to the Commission. Just to give you a sense of what we're going to be covering today, I'm going to provide a little bit of background and introduction to our agency for folks who may not be familiar with us. We are going to be talking about uh, ocean transportation intermediary licensing and bonding requirements, and it's particularly timing since the Commission just yesterday voted to approve a final rule that will impact some of the licensing and bond requirements. So it's a, an interesting topic today to speak about. We are going to cover NVOCC tariff requirements and some exceptions to those requirements. We're going to look at some of the problem trends that the Commission is seeing that impact uh, ocean transportation intermediaries. We're going to look at some of the Commission initiatives that address some of those issues and others. And we're going to take a look at the services that are available to the shipping public and various stakeholders through the Commission's Office of Consumer Affairs and Dispute Resolution Services. For folks who may not be familiar with the Commission, we are an independent regulatory agency, which just means that we report directly to Congress. We're not a cabinet agency. We were established in 1961 by President Kennedy. We have five commissioners that have been nominated by the President, and they're confirmed by the Senate. They serve for staggered five-year terms for continuity purposes with no more than three members of the President's party sitting at any one time. So our current commissioners are Chairman Mario Cordero, Commissioners Doyle, Dye, Ladinsky, and Corey. With respect to our full-time employees, there are 125 of us located in, in uh, the District of Columbia, New Orleans, Houston, New York, Miami, LA Long Beach, and Seattle. So we're covering all of the major ocean shipping ports and interests across the country. With respect to FMC statutes and regulations, today's discussion is really going to focus on the Shipping Act of 1984 as amended by the Ocean Shipping Reform Act and our regulations that are available at 46 CFR Parts 500 through 565. We'd also like you to be aware, though, of go back one, aware of the Foreign Shipping Practices Act and Section 19 of the Merchant Marine Act, which are just some tools available to the Commission to deal with foreign shipping practices that may be detrimental to U.S. shipping interests. We also have jurisdiction over uh, cruise line financial responsibility. Uh, cruise lines are essentially required to file proof that they have coverage to compensate passengers in the event that there is a uh, failure to provide service or a, a passenger who might die or otherwise be injured on a voyage. So turning to ocean transportation intermediaries, as you are aware, there are two types. There are ocean freight forwarders who serve as the shipper's agent. We also have non-vessel operating common carriers that act as a common carrier to their shipper customer and a shipper to vessel operators, aka steamship lines. Under the new rule that was approved yesterday by the Commission, there will now be a three-year renewal period, which is actually going to go into implementation next year under the new rule. This basically means that licensees will go up 
to an online platform and just update uh, outdated information with respect to their address or other information associated with their licenses. The Bureau of Certification and Licensing has also provided us with current numbers of licensees. Uh, we currently have 973 ocean freight forwarders, uh, 1,727 NVOCCs, and as you can see, the vast majority of our licensees have both NVOCC and freight forwarder licenses at 2013. We also have a number of foreign registered NVOCCs, uh, 1,727 of them. One of the questions that I receive quite frequently are, what are the differences between freight forwarders and NVOCCs, and what are the, the various regulatory implications of those licenses? So what we've done is we've broken down a comparison for folks to take a look at. So for example, if you're a freight forwarder, as we discussed before, you're an agent to the shipper, you're not a common carrier, and therefore you have no tariff publishing requirement. However, if you're an NVOCC, given your common carrier status, you're required to publish a tariff or utilize one of our tariff exceptions. One area that can also be a little bit tricky is as a freight forwarder, you cannot enter into service contracts. Uh, it's a question that we get quite frequently. However, you can collect brokerage from a VOCC. The NVOCC, however, cannot collect bro that brokerage. One area that parties get into trouble is where you are licensed as both an ocean freight forwarder and an NVOCC, and you structure a transaction to utilize both aspects of your license in order to obtain brokerage. And the recommendation generally is the best practice is if you're going to act in a particular shipment, either choose your freight forwarder activity or your NVOCC activity. Do not try and manipulate that to collect brokerage. As a, an ocean freight forwarder, um, you know, as we said, you do not have to publish a tariff. You do not have to issue a house bill. However, as an NVOCC, you really should be issuing house bills. There have been a lot of issues lately with companies that have failed to issue house bills, and uh, some of the results have been problematic, both from a dispute perspective as well as an enforcement perspective. As an ocean freight forwarder, it's also really important to note that there are two ways that you should be identifying yourselves on the ocean master bill. That's the steamship bill of lading. And essentially, the, your principal shipper really should be listed in that shipper's box. If you need to put your name in that shipper's box, it should be your name as agent for that principal company. If you are the NVOCC, we would be looking to see you listed in that uh, master bill of lading shipper box. Another question that we often receive are, is, when is a license required? And the short answer to that is any entity that's located within the U.S. that provides freight forwarding or NVOC services must be licensed with the Commission. If you're located outside the U.S., you do not need to retain or obtain a license, but you need to file an FMC1 tariff registration form and hold a bond of $150,000. There's no license required, though, if you're a freight forwarder that is located overseas. As with everything else in life, there are exceptions to this rule. Agents uh, tend to be an issue because under the exception, if you're an agent of an OTI, you do not need a license. There's been a lot of confusion on this issue. The commission regulations do not define the term agent. However, commission staff look at general agency principles to determine whether the agent is actually operating as an unlicensed entity or whether it is, in fact, an agent. So a couple of things, and this is not an exhaustive list of things that commission staff would look at are, number one, is there a written agency agreement between the parties? Number two, is the licensed OTI taking responsibility for that shipment? So if something goes bump in the night, is that licensed agency going to step in and address that problem and be responsible and liable for that issue? The third aspect is we're going to look at the advertising and the paperwork. Is that licensed OTI identified and made known to the shipper and all parties that it's dealing with? Is it appearing on the shipping paperwork? Other general areas of exception, if you have a business and your primary interest is the sale of goods, you can provide the arrangements for your own uh, transportation of your goods and those of your related companies without a license. If you're a vessel operator and you're performing freight forwarding services for your, the cargo that you're moving, there's no requirement for a license. If you are exclusively arranging for GSA and military household goods shipments, 
there's no need for a license. But the minute that you start accepting other commodities, you will need to get an OTI license. Bond requirements. This is another area that is impacted by the new regulation that was approved yesterday. So from here on in, if you're a freight forwarder, you only need to be bonded at the amount of 50000 If you're an NVOCC, that is 75000 You no longer need to procure a $10,000 bond for each additional branch office. The regulation does not impact the, the current requirement for registered NVOs to maintain a $150,000 bond and register with the FMC. Turning now to some of the tariff requirements. As we said, both foreign-based and domestic-based NVOCCs are required to file a registration form FMC1. And you must publish rate and tariff, rate and rule tariffs meaning what charges you're assessing for origin destination pairs, what demerge charges may be in effect or, or rules that may be in, a, in effect. Um, are you mirroring the vessel operating common carriers, GRI increases, those kinds of things. There are a couple exceptions to the rule, though. Number one, we have NVOCC service arrangements, were, which are analogous to service contracts. So in, essence, in essence, your NVOCC is entering into a contract with its shipper customer that identifies a specific, a specific time frame for the contract to be in effect. It identifies uh, specific parties to who the contract is applicable, the commodities, the origin destination pairs, the, the rates involved, the surcharges, et cetera. And that agreement is filed with the commission. In that instance, a tariff is not necessary. The second piece is the negotiated rate agreement, which is a newer offering that the commission has where parties go ahead, they file a tariff, putting the community on notice that they're going to be using NRAs. They maintain a rules tariff that is free of charge uh, for their shipper customers to peruse and understand. But the Flexibility is in the ability for the parties to informally agree in writing, such as an email, on you know, specific shipments, the commodity involved, the origin destination pairs, and the rate for those particular shipments. As you're probably aware, right now in front of the agency, there is the NCBFA petition P215, where the organization is requesting the commission to initiate a rulemaking to expand upon the inclusion of economic terms other than rates and to allow for modification upon mutual consent. This is going to be a wait and see upcoming attraction to see what the commission does with this. So in speaking with colleagues from the Bureau of Certification and Licensing, as well as the Bureau of Enforcement, and drawing upon some of the trends that we're noting in the Office of Consumer Affairs and Dispute Resolution Services, there are certain issues that we're seeing. Uh, first and foremost, we're seeing a lot on congestion-related delays and demerge, and we're going to speak about that more in depth further on, so I'm going to move forward down a little bit. We're also seeing OTIs that are failing to update their information with the agency or to replace vacant QI positions. So for example, your qualifying individual dies or moves on to another position, you're not replacing them, and it puts companies at risk for license revocation or enforcement action. So it's something that you want to be uh, aware of. Now, one mechanism that's going to deal with this, potentially going forward, is the, the new license renewal requirement, which will keep track of that. Uh, keep in mind, though, that even though we have that coming in the next year, right now you're still required to update the commission as changes occur. Another issue that we see are NVOCCs allowing other NVOCCs to utilize their service contracts. And this is something that is, um, an issue that will definitely potentially run you into some trouble with the Bureau of, uh, the Bureau of Enforcement. Uh, this is a situation where perhaps you have one NVOCC that's looking to enhance or increase its minimum volume commitment, and so they're basically borrowing another company's service contract. It also goes back to what we were talking about, the necessity of each NVOCC issuing its own house bills. Because for example, if you have a legitimate transaction where you have an NVOCC on behalf of its shipper company that is issuing its own house bill and then going to the next NVOCC as its carrier and that company is issuing a house bill demonstrating that legitimate transaction going to the vessel operator, it puts you at less of a risk to run afoul of this problem. 
Another issue that we're seeing is ocean transportation intermediaries accepting export shipments from unlicensed OTIs. And this is a significant problem. We also understand that there are times when unlicensed OTIs utilize names that are very similar to licensed companies. So one of the innovations that the Commission has introduced to deal with this has been a search function on our website where you can search a company by name, organization number, address, even zip code to discern whether or not the company you're dealing with is appropriately licensed. And this is particularly important. The, the past common wisdom was that, well, if I take a shipment from an unlicensed entity and something goes wrong, I can go ahead and deal with the underlying shipper. I can tell you that a recent trend we're seeing is more people walking away from shipments as demurrage and other issues accrue while people are trying to ascertain the interested parties involved with these shipments. Another issue we're seeing is NVOCCs accepting imports from foreign unregistered NVOCCs. This is particularly predominant in commercial shipments where we see very complex transactions with multiple NVOCCs and you have an unregistered NVOCC holding an original bill of lading or otherwise refusing clearance and holding up uh, a shipment that is at destination and collects emerge and all other sorts of havoc before it can get released. Again, just like our licensing and requirements and the companies listed on our website, you can also refer to the same website tool to determine whether a company is registered or not. And also, if you are having some confusion or unable to access that particular site, you can always call the Office of Consumer Affairs and Dispute Resolution Services or Bureau of Certification and Licensing just to make sure that a company is licensed and bonded. Another issue that we see, and this is something that I always raise with our vessel operating common carriers as well, there are, is a huge trend that is transpiring where a company might be going out of business and is sending a lot of shipments to a particular NVO or a number of NVOs. And they rack up the shipments and they fail to pay for them. And the, the one NVO keeps accepting these shipments. And, and what we always tell NV, the EOCCs, and I'm now telling the NVOCC community, is if you're seeing a transaction where people are continuing to send you things without paying, cut them off, you know, demand payment up front, but usually is not a good sign and that company is folding. On the other side, if there is an NVO out there that is having financial problems, you know, I will say do not hide. If you need to, come to caters to get assistance in working out differences with companies and trying to effectively handle that wind up of the business to make sure that shipments are moving forward, we can help you with that. So, that is that piece. And then the other thing, which tends to be a very popular trend that comes up every now and then are hostage shipments due to a prior dispute. The way it works is that you have a shipment that sailed that there might be a payment dispute on and somehow got released. And then maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of months down the line, another shipment comes in and the NVOCC, or Vessel Operating Common Carrier, puts a lien on that shipment to exact payment from the initial shipment on a separate bill of lading that was the subject of the dispute. There is now commission precedent that indicates that that type of activity is a violation of the Shipping Act and it's something that we see quite a bit at the commission. So going from problems to looking at initiatives. Number one, the commission received various reports of challenges resulting from congestion. So last year, the Commission took the action of holding four port forums across the country, Los Angeles, Baltimore, Charleston, and New Orleans, for the purpose of getting input from all aspects of the industry as to what the problems were, potential solutions, and, and to basically get a bigger sense of what was going on. So far, the result of those forums has been two publications that were published by Commission staff. Number one, the U.S. Container Congestion and Related International Supply Chain Issues, an overview of discussions at the FNC Port Forums that was issued this summer, which basically looks at some of the issues discussed, such as, for example, chassis availability, demurrage, et cetera, to kind of give a flavor of the situation and some of the suggestions that were provided. The other report, Rules, Rates, and Practices Relating to Detention, Demurrage, and Free Time for Containerized Imports, Moving Through Selected U.S. Ports, was issued back in April. And 
That basically laid out the demerge practices among some of the larger ports and carriers and provided a comparison and listed some options that might be open to the Commission. Right now, the Commission has not announced any further steps that it might take. One of the questions, though, that I encounter quite frequently from members of the shipping public are what can we do in the meantime, particularly with the demerge issue. And one of the things that I would say to parties is if you're having a particular dispute that's ongoing involving demerge, you can always call the Office of Dispute, uh, Office of Consumer Affairs and Dispute Resolution Services to assist you with that. You also have the option to file a formal docket at the Commission for Reparations if there is a violation of the Shipping Act. So there are ways that you can get involved even while the, the Commission is, has issued its report and has not announced whatever steps it might take. Another major initiative is our agency partnership. And this is both on an informal and formal basis. For example, we regularly are in contact with other agencies. We had a, an issue come up recently where there was an individual trying to get a hold of a particular agency to get a better understanding of the regulations. And due to those relationships, we were able to facilitate that partnership and uh, educational experience for that individual. On the formal side of things, the Commission does have a memorandum of understanding with um, the Customs and Border Protection. We are a member, uh, a member agency on ITDS. We also have a memorandum of understanding with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to help protect consumers that encounter moving fraud. And there are a host of different activities that the Commission is undertaking under these partnerships. We're also in the process of retrospective regulatory review. What does that mean? Basically, simply put, uh, we are going to our existing regulations to find simplification of those regulations to make it more feasible for our stakeholders and to simplify them wherever possible. So some of you may be aware that we have already undertaken a review of the Commission's practices and procedures under Part 502, and we've issued some improvements to those. One thing that is going to be a coming attraction is that the Commission voted yesterday to instruct staff to move forward with drafting an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking with respect to the service contract rules. So that will be something to keep an eye on in the coming months. Another huge Commission initiative is outreach and education. We have done some amazing work with our website to continue that mission, we have engaged in social media. Our Office of the Secretary has been very busy working on with Twitter announcements, with RSS feeds. If you are not signed up for those, I would definitely recommend that you do that just to keep your finger on all of the, the different uh, matters that are coming up the Commission and the different initiatives that are coming forward. In addition to that, Caters has a very important role in education and outreach that I'm going to get into a little bit more detail coming up. And also, as part of that, we as a part of that, we have the Caters Mediation Toolkit, which is now up on the, the Caters webpage. And this is a new innovation that allows folks to get a primer on negotiation tips and tactics. It also helps parties plan out a negotiation, whether it is for use in an ombuds proceeding, whether it's for use in a mediation, or you can even use it when you're going to your service contract negotiations as kind of an organizational tool. So I highly recommend that folks take a look at this tool that's available on the Caters webpage. Turning to Caters, we are predominantly responsible for outreach and education and for ADR services. What that means is that we conduct webinars such as this one. We go out to various trade associations and groups to provide information about commission programs, commission regulations, as well as the use of our services to help parties prevent and resolve disputes. We also have worked with institutions that have asked us to come in and provide some type of presentation or training for their employees to give them a better sense of what the commission regulations are, how the programs work, and how it impacts a particular company. Turning to ADR services. The Commission created the Office of Consumer Affairs and Dispute Resolution Services back in 2004. And recently, we became an independent office, meaning we report directly to the Office of the Chairman. And that's to make sure that we are not under or influenced by other 
program offices. The reason that they did this was they were seeing a lot of disputes out there. And in practicality, by the time you're done litigating your dispute, if you decide to litigate at all, you've ruined the commercial relationship involved. You probably don't get what you want out of that in terms of the release of cargo, keeping things moving. So what we did was we provided a voluntary form, meaning both parties would consent to come in and work with a neutral third party from the commission to explore practical, creative, real-time solutions to their problems. And the program has had some cost savings. Parties are not having to file litigation or they're you know, basically resolving out of court. And in addition to that, there's the cost savings involved of those commercial relationships and using that process to expand your commercial portfolio with a party that you might once have been disputing with. In addition, we have experienced neutrals with industry knowledge. All of the folks and caterers have had extensive training on transportation law, commission regulations, and regularly train up on ADR techniques and innovations. When I say ADR, what do I mean? It's a really fancy term that really just means a type of dispute resolution that happens outside of a court, it's more informal, and it employs a third party neutral. We have four types of dispute resolution services that you can choose from. The first three, um, BUDS, mediation, and facilitation, are what we refer to as non-adjudicative services. What this means is that cater staff will not tell you how to resolve your dispute or order you to take a particular action. Both parties agree to come in and work out their problems. And they are the captain of their own ship in terms of that ultimate resolution. They call the shots. So breaking down those first three techniques, the ombuds and rapid response teams, it is shorthand for a number of services that we provide. We provide a range of services from information gathering and providing coaching. So what that means is if a company calls me and says, I don't want you to contact this party that I'm having a dispute with. I really just want some tips on how I can better approach them in negotiation. Or a company gave me this contract. I don't understand what these terms mean. It's technical jargon. What does that mean? And we can work with those parties to provide them with information on a neutral basis without contacting the other party and it's neutral. On the other end of the spectrum, there are times when parties want us to contact them. And we provide many mediations via telephone and allow the parties to work out real-time disputes. A couple examples of this. Uh, the demurrage contacts, which has been very near and dear to people's hearts. We have received a number of demurrage complaints this year, and you will see some of the charts further on in the presentation. Recently, one of our staff members worked incredibly hard and was able to achieve 100% refund of the demurrage and detention fees that were accrued during a court congestion event. These types of issues are very fact specific and really require the parties to take a look at what's going on and look at potential resolution. Another example, a little bit more complex, dealt with a case we had a couple years ago where a major hospital institution came to us and asked us for assistance. It had hired an unlicensed company who failed to get the appropriate import licensing at destination. And it was a major medical initiative that was going on. They needed to get these live samples over to that country, and Foreign Customs sees them. And so we actually worked with the Department of State and the consulate overseas, who in turn helped us work with that foreign country's government to get those samples released and moving to where they needed to be. And it was a success. So we have a wide range of things that we deal with under the ombuds umbrella. The mediation service, turning to that, there are a couple ways that mediation comes to us. Uh, number one, through the recent change to our regulations under 5OT that I alluded to, now if you are going to a formal proceeding before the commission for reparations, you need to have a mediation conference. And so basically what happens is you sit down with the other party and cater staff to see whether mediation is feasible for you. We've resolved a few cases uh, through this process. It's been pretty successful. In addition to that, there are a lot of parties who walk in from the get-go and say, either I'm in litigation, I've got what we call parallel forums, maybe litigation is 
potential litigation at the FMC, maybe a contract issue somewhere else, or they want to avoid litigation and they have multiple issues and they need one-stop shopping. So we provide a forum where you can take your contractual or tort issues, your regulatory issues, your commercial issues. I've even had people come to me and say, I can't stand the person I'm working with, help me work with them. So what we do is we sit down with them either in person or on the telephone, and it could be two parties, it could be more than two parties for a particular dispute. And we work with them to come up with resolution that's meaningful to them. This is the kind of option that you want if you've gone to your attorney and said, look, I, I want an immediate result here and I want X solution. And your attorney says, I, I understand what you're saying, but only Y is available if you go to a judge. This is your option for creative problem solving. So with that particular product, we're able to work with parties, bring them hopefully to resolution, and reduce it to a settlement agreement, which is enforceable. Our next service that we provide is facilitation. And where mediation and ombuds are dealing with a particular dispute, facilitation generally has a broader connotation. For example, it could be a discussion about best practices that members of the industry want to have. And we bring those parties together and help them communicate and brainstorm concepts to look towards resolving or even discussing a particular issue. So those are the three non-adjudicative services that caters provide. The final service that we offer is arbitration. And this differs because it is adjudicative. It is a cater staff member that renders a legal opinion, an award, that orders a party to either provide reparations to a party or to basically dismiss the case and say that there, there is no legal case here. Whereas the ombuds, the mediation, the facilitation were one-stop shopping, arbitration really is limited to legal issues. Okay, So those are the, the four services that we provide. So who is using our services today? We have a broad variety of clients, if you will. We have shippers and consumers who come to us from all different places around the world. We have ocean transportation intermediaries that regularly contact for assistance. We have carriers that come in for, for different concerns, uh, marine terminal operators, truckers, and trade associations. So some examples of disputes. Um, we talked before about some of the regular problems that we were seeing in the trends. And those are issues that we currently see uh, before cater. Some additional ones, port congestion, we alluded to that it has been something that has been on the forefront. We're going to show some slides in the next couple slides, giving you an idea of this. Co-loading disputes are something that is particularly pervasive. You have uh, differences in opinion or agreement between two NVOs that are co-loading, and it can have real ramifications on getting that shipment delivered. And we work with those parties to make that happen. Service contract issues all the time. There could be a dispute over what the rate was meant to be. There could be a dispute over interpretation of a basic term. And those are things that can come up that we can help parties with. We also help parties with household goods issues and use vehicle issues. We also work a lot with cruise line disputes. So if there's anyone out there who has taken a cruise or is planning a cruise and needs some additional information or assistance, we're here to help on those as well. To give you an idea of what our caseload is, in the fiscal year 2005, there were 60% of our cases dealt with commercial cargo. And the and of that, 26% were comprised of household goods cargo. 14% were cruise-related cases. And for some reason, the values are not showing up on the screen. I'm not sure why. But I'll, I'll repeat those figures just so you have them. 60% on cargo, commercial cargo. You have 26 on household goods and 14% on cruise. Okay, turning to the demerge trend in fiscal year 2015, as you can see, we had started to receive a little bit of a ping on the demerge cases at the beginning of the year. Quarter two, it started to increase. We had a huge spike in the third quarter, and we are still receiving, well, we still received them in quarter four, and we're going into our first quarter of the new fiscal year, and we are still receiving the merge cases. Okay. So what are some of the benefits of using caters? I mean, you've seen these slides on demerge. We talked a little bit about some of the cases. 
number one, there's no charge for our services, so there's really nothing to lose. If you go to us, we're not going to charge you for the time you spend, and if you walk away from the table, you can still pursue litigation, or if you have a different arbitration provider, you can go to that forum for relief. You're controlling your risk. As I said, you're the captain of your own ship. The outcome of the proceeding, at least for the three adjudicative services, are based on what the parties agree to. With arbitration, you're still controlling your risk because under commission regulations, you're required to enter into a written agreement that sets forth a maximum amount that you're willing to be liable for. So there's a real comfort level with what you're putting forward when you're going into the process. They enhance commercial relationships, and they also provide practical collaborative solutions. And I'll give you an example. A couple years ago, we had a mediation that involved a very difficult situation. It was a commercial shipper who had purchased some items online, and unknown to that individual, they happened to be hazmat. So it went into commerce as an unidentified hazmat, which is a problem in itself. But to make matters worse for that shipper, it started to leak going into the port. And the container floor started falling through. So you, you kind of had a mess environmentally from a regulatory perspective, and you had all sorts of finger pointing from a commercial contractual perspective. So what we did was we got the parties together as caterers, and we were able to create that one-stop shopping where they decided to get together. They decided that there was a market for that cargo. It got filled off to pay for some of the cleanup and the environmental issues that were involved and, and satisfied a number of the interests that the parties brought to the table. There's also a quick resolution. In the case, for example, that I just mentioned, it was probably one of the longest mediations we've had. It was a nine-month process compared to probably a five to 10-year process that you would have seen in court. Traditionally, our mediations can last anything from a day to even a weekend to a couple months, but it's a lot faster than going through the process. Um, also, our rapid response function, just to, to note, from that perspective, within 24 hours of receiving your request, we have been in touch with a steamship offline contact who has agreed to get back in touch with us to start working on your resolution immediately. So it's a very good, quick resolution available to the public. The other thing we find in terms of using caters, there have been numerous studies that say that parties are more likely to follow through on an agreement than a court order. And they actually did a case study in Maine in the state court, and they found a vast majority of cases where issues were mediated, parties actually followed through because they felt they were getting something out of it versus a court order where maybe one party or neither party were happy. So how do you request, how do you obtain our services? So for ombuds, rapid response, and mediation, there's no prior written agreement required. And one thing I want to clarify, there are a lot of questions that we get. If I have a dispute resolution clause in my contract that identifies another party for arbitration, can I still use caters? The answer is yes, because basically it is a facilitated dialogue or a facilitated settlement negotiation. There is no bar to it. And parties can also agree at any time to use our services. With respect to the actual contact, it is on the slide. There is our complaints email and fax number. And to expedite your request, we always suggest that parties provide us with information. If it's a rapid response team request, please indicate that. Party contacts, a basic summary of the dispute, let us know what's going on, any documents that might be helpful to us in getting a better understanding of the dispute. Requests for arbitration are a little bit more involved. Uh, unlike the ombuds and mediation services, they require a written signed agreement by the parties. And this is because you're creating jurisdiction for a legal decision provided by commission staff through that contract or that written agreement. And there are two ways to do this. You can actually go into your service contract or your negotiated, I'm sorry, your, N, your NVOCC service arrangement and add a dispute resolution clause that identifies caters, or after the fact, you can come in with an agreement to arbitrate. And, and both are acceptable ways to get in there for arbitration. The arbitration agreement, as we said before, must have a potential cap. So in other words, you're liable for 500000 and not a dollar more. And it helps control the party's liability. 
Requests for arbitration uh, should be sent to our complaints mailbox, and you can also fax them to us. It's also notable that BIMCO recently suggested using caters to provide arbitration for service contracts. And I just have some of that information on this current slide. So we're beginning to gain some additional traction on the arbitration front. As I had mentioned, it may be advisable to consider including us in a dispute resolution clause in your service contract. The next three slides are just some sample language that you can use. I believe that the presentation is being emailed to you, and we're also, in the very near future, going to have this information up on our website as well that you can take a look at. So the first sample is a mediation with a, an arbitration default. So you try mediation for a certain amount of time. If that doesn't work, you can go and obtain arbitration for the commission. One note, uh, we do differ from some other organizations in that if you have a mediator and you wind up asking arbitration after the fact, we will give you a different arbitration. Um, the reason for this is we want people to feel comfortable sharing information with the mediator and we don't want parties to feel inhibited that whatever information they provide to the mediator may be used against them in an arbitration later. Okay. We also have just a basic arbitration clause that parties can use. Again, you don't need to specifically identify that you need mediation to use it in your service contract or NSA or tariff even. Alternative arbitration clause, it just basically sets the parameters where you are going to provide an amount that you have X amount of dollars that goes to caters, Y amount of dollars that might go to another forum of your choice. Thank you. Are there any questions out there? Yes, there are a couple of questions. And if anybody um, didn't send in their questions during the presentation, we encourage you to send them in now. So. The first question is, in regards to the vote from yesterday, will OTIs that are presently licensed have their OTI license extended to a three-year validity, or will the three years only come into effect when they renew their license after implementation of the rule next year? So my understanding of the question is you're basically trying to ascertain whether or not there's the timing, basically, of the renewal. And my understanding is it will be probably staggered, but we will have to see what they come out with in the publication of the final rule. OK, thank you. If placing a lien on a shipment due to a payment dispute from a prior shipment slash bill of lading is a violation, how are we expected to resolve payment disputes? That's a great question. And within caters, for example, we see that issue a lot. So what we'll try and do is work in the initial instance to get the cargo moving and then work with both parties on a voluntary basis to resolve the underlying dispute so that all parties' needs are met. OK, thank you. It looks like those are all the questions that we have. So if you have questions, um, hold on, we have another question that came in. What's the time frame like from time of applying for a caterer's intervention? Sure. So. you usually get a response the same day. As long as it's a, a normal business day, we get back to you the same day, if not the next morning. And with rapid response, if it's labeled rapid response, we immediately prioritize it. It goes to the front of the list. We get in touch with a steamship line contact who has agreed to respond to us within 24 hours to start working on the problem. OK, thank you. How is ADR funded? So basically, there are no charges for our services. It's basically the, the taxpayer who funds the services provided. It's part of the, the basic agency budget. OK, thank you. Um, it looks like those are the only questions we have for today. If you have any other questions, you can send them to me, nei at ncbfa.org, and I'll make sure that Jennifer gets them. So with that, Thank you all for joining, and thank you to Jennifer for your, Jennifer for your time and efforts in putting together today's presentation. I'd thank like you. to remind everyone to please complete the survey included in the webinar credential email, and also let you know I will be resending a, a copy of the presentation later today. So thank you all for your participation, and enjoy the rest of your day.